Happy third Thursday, everybody. And now let's talk automation. Hello, everybody. Happy third Thursday. We have got a wonderful group with us today to have our conversation about digital ways of working, agile and lean. And I think you guys are in for a really great treat with John and Simon joining us. They literally have written a book on these ideas. So we know that we're getting it directly from the source. Um, as we get started, it's kind of our typical third Thursday way. We're going to do our introductions along with some icebreaker questions for everybody to join in on the chat. So before we transition to those introductions, I want to encourage everybody that's joining us, make sure you're putting in where you're joining us from. If you have thoughts or feelings on these icebreaker questions as we get going, put those thoughts in there. We love to see those comments rolling in and hopefully include some of them in the stream as we're going. Um, so as we are getting all set up here, I want to come to you, John, first to get us started with the introductions. So can you share a little bit about yourself? And then the icebreaker question that I have for you is to give everybody that elevator pitch of what lean and agile ways of working look, uh, are um, to kind of get us started from a definitions standpoint. Sure. Thank you, Emma. Thanks for having me here. Um, so my name is John Smart. and I am the co-founder of Sooner Safer Happier the company and the lead author for Sooner Safer Happier the book. I help organizations across industry sectors improve their ways of working. Um, I was previously a partner at Deloitte uh, leading on business agility. Prior to that, I was the head of ways of working at Barclays Bank and I've been an agile and lean practitioner since the early 1990s. So I've, I have a career of helping people on the journey from traditional ways of working to more agile and lean ways of working. In terms of the icebreaker around what is agile, what is lean, my favorite articulation of what is agile is think big, start small, learn fast. Think big, high alignment, a clear goal, start small, even smaller, minimize time to learning, learn fast. And agile suits work which is unique and it's unknowable and there are unknown unknowns, which is why it's important to have agility and run experiments and to act. Lean, on the other hand, suits repetitive work. So in terms of what is lean, lean is actually a word given to by an American to the Toyota production system, lean production, and it suits work which is knowable. So it's repetitive work and it's about flow, respect for people, continuous improvement, so Lean and Agile have a lot in common. They have a common root in Japan in the 1970s. The key thing in different, the key difference, Agile, you want variability, you want experimentation because you don't know, it's unique. Lean, you're minimizing variability and there's the concept of standard work. Look at that elevator pitch. You explained it so well in such a short period of time. Thank you for that. Simon, I'm going to come to you to give your quick introduction. And then what I would like you to kind of give us that elevator pitch on is we've discussed, you know, what is lean and agile. And now I want to focus on some of what you guys shared with us and will share with us today about the focus of business outcomes rather than just doing agile for agile sake. So if you could give us your introduction and then share a little bit of your thoughts on that. For sure. Hi, um, I'm Simon Aurora. Um, hello from Copenhagen, Denmark, this afternoon here for me. Uh, again, thanks for having us on. Um, so I'm a co-author on the book with John, very grateful to be asked to do that. Right now, uh, I head up enterprise architecture and ways of working uh, at Saxa Bank here in Copenhagen, um, but I'm a software developer um, and I've been doing Agile and Lean for not quite as long as John, but uh, since the late 1990s when I picked up the Extreme Programming White Book. Um, so for us, and this is something we learned on our uh, modern ways of working journey when we were working together at Barclays, the focus is not on doing Agile for Agile's sake. Uh, it's not on doing Lean for Lean's sake. We started off um, on our Agile journey in Barclays by effectively going up to people and saying, hey, we're the 
we're the agile team. We're here to make you agile. Uh, and we put a whole bunch of metrics around agility levels and seeing how well various departments were doing um, in terms of their agility levels. And we learned. We learned from our mistakes. And a lot of what the book is about is, is about us learning from doing the wrong thing. Um, and then uh, 18 months or so, in, we, we had a, um, a realization that this was entirely wrong. Instead of focusing on being agile and measuring agility, start with the why. What are you actually looking to optimize? And we came up with five things. Uh, better, um, and that's, that's quality of what you're doing. Value, um, and that's the unique thing that makes your business your business, whether that's uh, making handbags or jet engines. How do you do that and be awesome at doing that? So better value. And then John already talked about, about flow, better value sooner. Safety as well. Most organizations have some form of governance, compliance, and risk that they have to work with. And last but not least, happier. Happier colleagues, happier customers, happier community, and happier climate. So better value, sooner, safer, and happier are the outcomes that we advise very strongly that it's a good thing to focus on. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Mr. Kieran, before I come to you, I do want to just point out as I see these comments rolling in, we've got people across all time zones. I thought it was early for me. I see that we've got some California folks who are even a couple of hours ahead of me um, waking up bright and early with us to have these conversations. Um, and then I see a number of folks from UK and India. So we've got people from all over the world joining us. Um, and as I said, it's first thing in the morning for me, but it's afternoon for you, Kieran. Can you say good afternoon to everybody, give your introduction. And then the icebreaker that I'd like you to do is just kind of share what do we mean when we say digital ways of working and why is this conversation relevant for the third Thursday before we head into some of our other conversations? Okay, I'll try and remember all that. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> That's the first thing. Who am I? For those who don't know me, like I'm a digital expert in terms of data analytics, intelligent automation, and social media strategy. I'm Emma's co-host uh, uh, on the show. Delighted everyone's here, and thank you for taking the time to turn up and to listen to all of us today. Uh, digital ways of working. Look, first of all, probably what are they? Uh, I don't know of a perfect definition. I know that we have you know, digital natives and we have new firms, but what I would say is it's about digital channels and methods, and that's everything from intranets to collaborating uh, using tech like Teams or Zoom or whatever else. Just because you've Zoom doesn't make you uh, digital, by the way, but it's about having those interfaces internally and those applications and connections to customers and uh, engaging at distance and listening. It's about uh, content marketing, you know, sharing openly on Facebook and LinkedIn and driving business do it using that method. It's about those skill sets that the chaps have talked about, you know, lean and digital and design thinking. And it's about more than that. It's about your HR strategy aligned to your business strategy. It's about building a company forward, you know, a willingness to employ tools and techniques and mindsets and product sets and skill sets to you know move fast break things fail go again it's about a reliance on data and making data driven decisions about continually improving and collaborating and breaking down silos you know so i don't think digital is one thing i don't think digital ways of working are just a thing i would go back to what john was saying at the beginning it's all about business outcomes but about how we actually deliver in this day and age has changed and if COVID. Uh, if taught us anything, that all the things we thought may not have been possible are all now possible. And we're seeing methods and applications and peoples and mindsets and product sets and skill sets all working together to deliver outcomes in a new and joined up business way. So I hope that answered the question, Emma. It sure did. So John, I'm going to come to you for our first like official, official question of the conversation. And this one actually came from, and I think I see him in the comments, um, Ryan, one of our kind of loyal viewers of the Third Thursday. And he was wondering um, what kind of tips and strategies you have for organizations that are really looking to kind of get started and get on board with agile and leading ways of working. How do you start to encourage that shift of mindset? Um, so I'll come to you to kind of go from there. Sure, thank you. And I'm also going to touch on the question from Neeraj in the comments, in the answer. 
Um, and, and that question is, uh, do you come across the challenge where people show disdain by Agile by saying things like that never works here? So I'll kind of, I'll try to cover that one off as well. So how to go about this? Uh, what I would advise is, number one, start with why. It's not Agile for the sake of Agile. It's not Lean for the sake of Lean. It's not Digital for the sake of Digital, as Simon was saying. You know, it's so easy for organizations to get hooked on a buzzword or you know, we keep reading about Agile in Harvard Business Review. We need, we need some Agile. You know, I'd like to buy a truckload of Scrum Masters, please. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, Nokia Mobile were scoring very highly on their how, how Scrum are we Scrum test. So Scrum being a, a way to go about agility, but it didn't save Symbian. And according to the chairman of Nokia, the main reason for the failure of Symbian was a lack of psychological safety. And actually, it's it, this is about 80% about culture and only 20% around process and tooling. So um, so start with why and, and what, uh, what other problems you're trying to solve. And this was, again, back to what Simon was saying. Start with why and focus on the outcomes. So for any, anyone in an organization, ask the question, how's it going? Uh, how's things? It doesn't take long before someone starts saying, oh, well, you know, we've got, we've got some problems here, some problems there. And, and so I always start with a question, why? And then I ask what's going well. And then I'll ask what's not going well. The things that are going well, your strengths, very important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So a mistake to avoid is trying to do, you know, uh, is actually not building on your cultural strengths. So identify your cultural strengths and amplify them. Don't, you know, don't forget about them or throw them away. At the same time, what are the challenges we've got? And this is not, this is without even using the A word, without even talk or the D word, agile or digital. But what are you struggling with? Um, every single time, the answers that come out are, we're too slow, we're too inefficient, we'd like to be faster, we'd like to increase colleague engagement, we'd like happier customers. You know, it's a pretty consistent set of themes. We've gone through a technological revolution. Once every 50 years, there is a new technology-led revolution. And this is where the digital word comes in. We had the age of oil and mass production, before that, we had the age of electricity and heavy engineering. Before that, we had steam and railways. Before that, we had the first industrial revolution, textile mills in northern England. So every 50 to 60 years, there's a technology-led revolution. And this is what we are so lucky enough to live through right now. Um, so for organizations, start with the why, start with the outcomes, invite over inflict. So this is one of the, one of the things we write about in the book. Invite participation. It's the anti-pattern here is inflicting a capital T transformation top down across an organization of you all have to do agile whether you like it or not. The capital A on the agile is this is how you're going to work. The capital T is you don't have a choice. So instead, appeal to internal motivation and appeal to the natural champions and people who've been trying to do this at the organization despite the organization in the past. Get behind your champions, run a community of practice, have a, it changes social, really, really important. You need to communicate, 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 have a, a voluntary community of practice, share your learnings, internal learning, external learning, start small, nail it before you scale it, storytelling, and then over time, you, it's an S-curve profile. You start, to, you start to go up the S-curve, you can increase your gradient, you can start to go faster. So... There's a whole bunch of thoughts there around how to get going. Uh, start with a selfish gene. You know, start with what problems do you have that, are, that need a solution? Thank you. And I'm going to take something you just said right there at the end of nail it before you scale it. And that is a perfect segue into this question that I have for Simon. And it's this idea of, you know, why should we avoid a big bang transformation? A little bit of what we were talking about with that tap capital T transformation. Um, can you share your thoughts on why that idea of, of moving kind of slower um, to get started is the, the right approach? Yeah, of course. And I think 
start with going back to what John said right at the start when you said, what is agile? Well, agile is think big, but start small and learn fast. You've got to take an agile approach to, to, to becoming agile. If, if that's something you want to do, then don't, don't do it in a waterfall, big bang way. Be agile about becoming agile. Um, what, what we talk about a lot in the book is, is the S curve. And luckily with this being visual, it's not just a podcast, I can actually bring the uh, little curve up that S curve. And what that is about is, well, great. You start with awesome intentions, but then there's a dip. You're always gonna slow down. Learning new things is going to slow you down before it speeds you up. That is, that is simply natural. And that dip, the bigger the dip, the more likelihood is you're going to fail. If you're doing a massive, massive transformation, that dip is going to be long. It's going to be months, six months, maybe, maybe even into the years. And the strong likelihood is you, your managers, your organization are going to give up on that point and say, this isn't working. There's a whole bunch of context around that. The pace that you can change is the pace of unlearning and relearning um, and people have a limited capacity to, to unlearn their old ways and, and effectively relearn new ways on top of that that needs a lot of leadership support which I, I think john can talk a little bit more about later um, and ultimately that change is emergent trying to plan it in a big way assumes a deterministic approach to change. It assumes you've got a crystal ball that you can predict the future. The, the patterns of agility, like the Spotify model or the Scaled Agile framework that worked for someone else maybe are gonna work for you. That, that's simply not the case. Every organization is, is unique. And the, the way of improving ways of working is emergent. So instead of having one big S curve, what we say is you should have lots of small S curves. Each one is an experiment of how different practices work in your organization. You can use some awesome techniques like uh, the Toyota Carters in particular, the, the coaching Carter, to run those experiments, to push teams hard beyond where they think they can go. But ultimately those experiments are about learning what works well to improve your organization. And you simply have to do that in small ways. You have to learn and it will take time. Um, and those experiments will push you up the continuous improvement curve, but they're all, all contextual and that they are not big bang. It's, it's, it's start small and, and, and build big from that small. Wonderful. And I just put a, uh, I saw a comment from uh, Ryan about buying the book and getting a physical hard copy, just like Simon showed. And I did put a link in there for everybody to check out the website and you can order the book directly from there. So I wanted to make sure to draw attention to that and I will probably put it back into the chat so it's nice and easy for everyone to see another time. Um, and so then when we Take a look at, Karen, I want to come to you to get some of your direct experience with some of these ideas that we've been talking about. And this idea of, you know, again, moving slower to go faster and some of your experience kind of living and breathing in this environment and what you've found from that approach. Uh, yeah, oh, per perfect. And I'll probably build on what John was saying a moment ago. Uh, I've seen too many times over the years where folks get excited about technology or new ways of working or the new and latest shiny thing. And the bit they forget to focus on is the business why. So they get in robots because someone robots are hot. They want the data strategy because data is hot. And then they jump into this in a very small way without actually thinking, you know, uh, I want to start small, but I have a massive program, a massive idea in my head, and I'll scale really fast to get to that. Instead, they just rush to do the latest hot thing. Weeks go by, months go by, the team get more and more off track in terms of the project's probably not delivering and it's not going to build up to something huge. After they've gone down the road so far, and this is a mixture of investment of time and money and emotion and probably pride as well in there, and then they may have sold this new shiny thing to the leadership in the organization. And maybe it was one of the executive team who sold it to the other team. And pride of fear of getting, you know, failing or maybe getting sacked gets in the way of actually making the right decision, 
which is always, uh, no matter how often or how long a project takes, is to take time out to stop and reflect. And I don't just mean here when we're talking about agile or digital or whatever ways of working, doing an agile retrospective. That's key. That's important for every single project. But I think you need an independent review, and this is something I've practiced for years, including in my own projects, where I've brought in an independent expert who looks at the projects and says, are we actually on or off track? Is it delivering what it's meant to deliver? And this isn't about looking at a program where you're going to kick the people or encourage them uh, not to be truthful and honest and maybe wrap it all up and move in a different direction. If you do do that, by the way, and you set your team up to independently review but catch out teams, then you're not really going to encourage this new way of working, which for me is very much about trying to do things. Yes, you will fail, but you need to do a lot of stuff in a digital age to learn. You need to do it, reflect on it, learn your lessons, move forward. So this is very much about slowing down every so often or on a regular and planned basis, really looking at what's happening, really determining whether it's delivering or not for the business. If it's not helping that team reset and refocus, or if it's not accepting the fact that it has failed in the nice way, and by that I mean I call it negative learning. You've done something, it hasn't worked, you move forward in a different direction, but you codify the knowledge so that others don't make that same mistake. And you take that knowledge into a future project when maybe now wasn't the right time, but that forwards learning will allow you to grow at a later date. So something I've seen tremendous times over, Emma, that investment in time and money and resources, it's gone too far, but people are unwilling to stop. We have to accept there will be failure, but we need to put in those stops and checks that allows us to not waste more money or more time currently when we're trying to digitally transform our organizations. Thank you. And I think you just mentioned something that, again, is you guys are setting me up perfect for these segues. This idea of knowing that there's going to be failure, knowing that there is going to be pivot points in your transformation. But a big part of accepting that and feeling comfortable with that is the environment that you're working in and how comfortable you feel in that environment. And I think a lot of that, and John, this is question is going to come to you comes from the leadership and what is the leadership within an organization doing to foster that type of, of safety. And so I want to ask you specifically, you know, what are characteristics or, um, you know, behaviors that you think are absolutely critical for leadership to foster within an organization to be successful? I love, I love this topic. I love this question. This is, this is my favorite part of this topic. Uh, Lead, leaders, leaders will make it or break it. This is leaders at all levels. This is not somebody else as a leader. We, you know, we can't do it because of them. This is you as a leader. It doesn't matter if you've just joined as an apprentice, if you've joined as a graduate, everyone has the ability to be a leader. And there are people in leadership positions who are not leaders, they're managers or dictators. So, Leadership behavior will make it or break it. And in my opinion, it is that black and white. It's that binary. The, the typical anti-patterns that I see is, number one, not role modeling the desired behavior. So, for example, sitting around the virtual table or the physical table, arms crossed, uh, saying to the team, go on, transform. Tell me when you're done. Like, I'd almost, like, almost like, I dare you, transform. Um, I've seen that a number of times. It's very obviously disingenuous and it's very obviously not authentic. And not surprisingly, the people in that area um, generally generally won't have the won't feel safe to change. Uh, which leads me to number two. Number two is a culture of fear, command and control. And a culture of fear will kill any form of change dead in the water. There was one organization I was working with, uh, which was led with a culture of fear. There was a top down diktat, which is you all need to do two week iterations, whether you like it or not. So of course, everyone did two week iterations. But there was no further continuous improvement. And what happened was, it was the same old behavior, with still a kind of waterfall sequential process, but just sliced into two week iterations. So you know, three two-week iterations of analysis, three two-week iterations of development in the case of IT, three two-week iterations of testing. Um, so that's number two. Number three is a deterministic mindset. 
So this means a Gantt chart with milestones and a view that you can predict the future for unique work, which you've never done before. And so the view that um, we can plan a project at the point of having learnt the least. And then the language which involves the word death, like drop dead date or deadline. Origins of the word deadline come from Camp Sumter in the US Civil War. If you put a finger past the wooden railing, which was the deadline, you were shot. Those are not great anal analogies to use in companies, but unfortunately, you know, in my experience, those words are used a lot in companies. Is it, is it really a deadline? Is it really a drop dead date? Are we really going to drop dead? Maybe if you're working unsustainably, it's, that's not a great analogy. So those are the three most common anti-patterns. So to turn those on their head, the patterns, the types of behaviors that we should seek from leadership, from leaders, from you as a leader, leaders at all levels. Number one, role model. Exhibit courage and vulnerability. It will feel uncomfortable. We are changing our ways of working, um, not for the sake of it, not agile for the sake of agile, but to improve our outcomes, to improve quality, value, time to value, safety and happiness. There is, there's learning anxiety, so you have to have courage and vulnerability. Secondly, you need psychological safety. You need to be able to intelligently fail. If you can't intelligently fail, nobody will experiment. And then number three is an emergent mindset. So this is acknowledging that the future is unknowable. This is maintaining options, maintaining variability, not insisting on a fixed milestone uh, in a Gantt chart. By the way, on a tangent, uh, I saw a question on Taylorism in the chat. Henry Gantt used to work with Frederick Winslow Taylor in the early 1900s. So the Gantt chart comes from a way of working which was, which was dictatorial. It was, I've got the clipboard, I've got the stopwatch, I'm gonna tell you when to start working and when to stop working. Dear worker, you have no agency. You can't decide for yourself. I'm the manager, I tell you what to do. That's the origins of the Gantt chart. Uh, so, you know, it's from two technology revolutions ago. It's a hundred years old. Unfortunately, as per the comment in the chat, lots of organizations are still working that way in the context of knowledge work, which is unique and not repetitive. Um, so an emergent mindset, so the pivot here is to focus on the outcomes, not the output. So what's our outcome roadmap? And this is where OKRs are a great tool, objectives and key results, because it's an outcome focus. We're not being prescriptive on how we're going to get there. We expect you to run experiments and have a, a wiggly line to achieve the outcome. I'm a big fan of the wiggly line outcome achieving. <laughs> we do have just a couple minutes left. So Simon, I know that we could probably talk about this for a half an hour in itself, but I do want to at least briefly touch on the idea of, you know, how do we maintain operations while we're going after these new ways of working and this new business value. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to you quickly and then we will kind of wrap up after our um, our thoughts on this, this item. Sure, um, like you said, I can talk about this forever. Uh, the, the very short answer is DevOps. Um, you build it, you run it, the team that is delivering the new ways of working, the new features, the new value are also the team who are running operations at the same time. And the, the sort of anti-pattern that I've experienced is, well, pe people have sort of lost that definition of DevOps. They think DevOps is a role. It's a new person to sit in between Dev and Ops and do some boring stuff. Or DevOps is about tools. We bring in Jenkins and we bring in Git and we bring in JIRA and then we're done with DevOps. And it's not, DevOps is a, it's a lifestyle, it's an attitude, it, but it fundamentally it's about understanding that a product that is there to be built to deliver value to customers needs operations just as much as it needs new features and these things need to be balanced and they need to be owned by the team. And ultimately that might turn into no ops if the team are really, really good at automating their operations tasks or, or uh, automating the way they handle failures, uh, getting graceful degradation, getting self-healing code and self-healing uh, software. But DevOps is at the heart of this and the, the sort of back to basics DevOps of this is 
it's it's all one team doing the same thing, which is running and building new um, fundamentally. That that is how to balance the two things. Wonderful. And you did like such a great job. We still have 10 seconds to wrap it up. I'm impressed. <laughs> I do want to take a moment to thank you both again for joining us for the conversation. We have so many questions and back and forth in the chat that are going on. Um, we will be making a point of coming back to that over the next couple of days and hopefully keeping the conversation going. And I will in the chat another time add that link to um, the the website where you can download the book, as well as subscribe to a newsletter to get more of John and Simon's thoughts on these ideas. Because as we mentioned many times in the chat and during the discussion, 30 minutes is not enough for this. Um, so again, make your way over, look at the, the newsletter and um, make sure that you're following both of these guys as well. And have a happy third Thursday, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.